next generation of conservationists, education, community engagement, and other issues. Just like we did previously, I'd like to give one minute to each one of the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, my name is Alexandra Moore. I'm a jewelry designer. Um, on one end, I feel very much at home with everybody here on stage and, and the audience. I bet we share a lot in common. And on the other hand, I know that some people might ask themselves, what does a jewelry does? A designer have to do with all that? So if it's okay, I would like to start with just a short video, because I think it will help me uh, capsulate in a short time what I do, so I can move on to your questions and explain better why I'm here. Okay, we, we take the others, and then we come to the video. Perfect. Right. Please. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Fleury Leclerc. I'm a children book author. The reason why I started writing for, for children was because I wanted to find myself, and find, I wanted to find some books where I can identify myself. So, the first story I wrote was Snowflower and the Panther. And the reason why I wrote Snowflower and the Panther, because I was born in Cameroon, and raised in Cameroon until I was 10 years old, and I moved to, and I moved to France. So, the, 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 the reason why I wanted to start creating stories for our children in Africa, and start and introducing animals of Africa, where children can read the story and feel like they also belong. I wanted to create the fairy tale side that we don't we don't always find in Africa. So I started with Snowflower and the Panther, and I continue with African Animal ABC, in which I kind of I kind of explain all the different habitats of the different animals I picked. Why? Because I think it's important for to introduce in our um, uh, African culture and uh, all those different values that we have in Africa that are so fundamental and that our children can recognize themselves. In the same way, we can also impact other children from the world, and they can see the beauty of Africa, and not only a side of Africa that sometimes is more about uh, poverty or famine. So, that's why I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for me, 10 years ago, when I realized that social media was growing in Nigeria, where I come from, and people were using to talk about politics a lot in election, and I thought, if I could change my name to Esther Kleinman on Twitter and Facebook, and in, get engaged in this conversation, who would pause to ask, why am I called Esther Kleinman? And then I can arrest the attention. So I started that in um, 2009, and um, I want to tend to be alive now because climate change is one of the biggest issues now. In terms of wildlife conservation, I was privileged to, um, to work with the Nigerian government in 2015. And I happened to uh, work with the, the then Minister of Environment, Amina Mohammed. And uh, my job there was to have to mobilize young people for climate action. And one of the key ways of talking about the wildlife in the national parks. Um, so we started a campaign called Wildlife Energy, um, with the then um, had a wildlife who started past year last year and was honored by scientists for her work. Um, so for me, using communication, social media to mobilize in the continent as well young people is a great reason that I can do now. Um, and, and now we we'll are seeing that conversation grow now in wildlife in terms of all Africans, not just for our colleagues that come all the way from the Western country <coughs> to consume those um, resources, but also for us young people because this is 2020. We love to go to safari, it's not good to kill the animal, but to enjoy it. And also to, of course, to take pictures on Instagram and Facebook as well. Yeah. So for me, that's why my, my background is using communication to empower young people. I'm not just for climate change, but also for conservation of resources as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Alexandra, please. Hi, now, we have the issue of your profiles that you just mentioned. How do you address the issue of uh, the challenges facing the conservation in terms of uh, seeking solutions? Now we're looking for options. When you were working on climate change, what were the biggest challenges that you were confronted with? Well, it was the awareness of the issue and the problem of knowing. For instance, we have young people studying wildlife at the university, but have never been to a wildlife conservation, for instance. Um, and we have to change that, and I'm happy that 
we realize that young people can also contribute to do that. And one way of doing that is to reach out to our partners, get, invite these young people to volunteer for them, because they have this academic background, they also need the field background to be able to be you know, the leaders of the wildlife um, department in the future. So I think for me that's one. Um, and these young people now we have now are very passionate. So we can say that they are leaving. They are very passionate. They know this is their time, this is their future, this is their resources. They want to do so. They're willing to do that. They just need the opportunity um, to do that. I think for me, that's that's what's one sort of solution to do that. And also to to government to, to open up communication channels for them to engage. Uh, we talked about community engagement. Young people can be that channel to engage with the community, the private sector, and the people in desert conservation. Uh, using social media, using live stream, using you know proper participatory communication to do that. So for me, that's one of the solutions. But it has to be deliberate. People need to do not talk about it. They need to really, really go on to do it. And I think that's why I'm a bit happy um, that back home in Nigeria, we're doing the same thing here in Nigeria as well. We're working with the US Embassy and the government of Nigeria to do that deliberately, making sure it happens, not just talking about it in the panel, but going to say, hi, come here, come join us, let's talk about this. Let's have that proper conversation because you are the highest population in the continent. And we have to leave somehow. Um, I think that intergenerational partnership that's deliberate is the right way to go. Uh, Florida, the, the African Union has declared the diaspora as the sixth region of Africa. What are your perspectives on the role of the diaspora in this connection? So I, th I think it's, for me, it's the thing I find it difficult is um, it's important to start impacting the children from a very young age. When we spoke earlier, we talked about, we saw that at, at age 18, and for me, I want to start when, they, when they're born with. Um, with like younger children books to, to explain them and also to include into the curriculum in, in, in schools. When I was in Cameroon, I, I was I, I was raised I was 10 years old, I, I was still learning in school about my ancestors from Gaul, with Ancestoli Gaulois. So I think it's important to see what we have in our curriculum and start impacting our children about our fauna, our flora, the beauty of what we have in Africa. And those has to start from a very young age because that's how we're going to start creating the interest on them. And that's how we start to create the curiosity on them to learn about what what's, what's, uh, surrounds them. So I think that the, 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 the problem that we also have is there's a lot of difficulties. Like a lot of people in Africa, they don't have any job, they don't have... So now we've been talking about why that's not conservatory and it is so important to start that conversation and to be able to be proactive. But it has to work together with with the, with the different side of the politics in Africa. And the problem that we have now is, is it's very difficult to ask to be people to be able to like, to go and take care of an animal, but when sometimes they can't even take care of themselves. And I think that's, that's what is very important for our leaders to recognize that problem, which is fundamental, and to start helping the people, and the, and the people can help themselves and help the surrounding. And it's, 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 it's essential because it has to be like a global, like a global vision, not only one side. Because it's really difficult to ask someone to kind of take part of, of, of some conservatory side when they, can, they don't even know how they can find a job or they don't even know how they can take care of their family. I mean, if I can add to that, I think you also need to look at the issue of working in silos. When we talk about wildlife conservation, it's always the Minister of Environment. We need the Minister of Education as well, like she said. If the two can come together, and, and, and I mean, the curriculum is owned by the Minister of Education, not the Environment. But they can come together to work in the sense that from primary school, like public schools, they have that on, on, from the onset. And they work together to do that, not working in silo and doing conservation and doing education. We have to work together to do that. I think that's one way we can move forward. Alexander, I was struck by your experience in terms of uh, art for conservation in you know, the environment that you shared. Uh, Alexandra spent the past seven years in the heart of Manhattan, working on her signature collections and growing the identity of the Alexandra Moore brand. She decided to move to the island of Bali, Indonesia, to search for new inspiration and a connection with meaningful practices that would enhance not just her work, but her spirit. Both were in need of an overhaul. 
Upon discovering that elephant ivory is still being used for jewelry, Moore was compelled to find a sustainable way to replace elephant ivory. It is estimated that up to 25,000 elephants are killed annually for their tusks. Deep in the Ecuadorian Amazon rainforest lies a seed that when carved takes on the appearance and characteristics of ivory. The tagua seed is a pure and natural botanical alternative to elephant ivory. In one year, a single tagua palm can produce as much ivory as an average African elephant can in its lifetime. And so, Alexandra had a thought. What if the tagua seed was used as an alternative to elephant ivory? The tagua, a nut that holds all of the possibility of the universe within it, and can offer a real solution to help stop the senseless killing of beautiful and soulful animals. Pure white, hard like a stone, this simple gift from one of Earth's great trees can be shaped by human artistry into objects of immense value and great beauty while simultaneously eliminating the need for elephants to meet a tragic end. The collection centers around the exotic beauty of traditional and handcrafted Balinese workmanship and heritage and natural wild harvested tagua seeds. Through this capsule collection, Moore will bring awareness to the tragic reality of species on the brink of extinction, the preservation of native forests and the people and culture that depend on their survival. The possibilities that the Tagua offers are relevant not only to Alexandra's journey. She hopes that these connections will lead to important discussions that must take place about the future of the planet. Good. Thank you very much. That's a good transition. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, that's a good transition to the uh, Q&A. Now, comments uh, to the panel, please. Do you see um, Red Plus as part of the solution? And um, how do you value carbon? And what is the role of African governments in setting that value, if it is indeed uh, to be part of the solution? But from my experience working in government, you notice that the forest conservation, the forest estate are owned by government. That's big. That's very, very big. Um, but either yeah, state government or federal government. So that's just two things. Um, so we can have to make sure that whatever policy that has, it has to have a community participating in them. Uh, for example, I was born and raised in Cross River, in Calabar, which has the biggest um, forest conservation, one of the biggest in Nigeria as well. The forest is owned by the government, state government. Federal government doesn't have the power to, to really engage, except in national reserves areas. So these are intricate things that we need to understand in terms of that. And I think that's why NGO play a big role. They have the power to engage both the local government, the state government, and the federal government to find this new way of preserving their own forest resources. And I think that's why bringing those people together, NGOs, well, international NGOs, local NGOs, um, I should work with government to advocate to demand to protect because that's we need them. That we for the state. I think for, for me that that's key. Uh, in terms of climate change, I also think that the young people now have the power to make their voices for the NGOs to demand that action is, is happening to address climate change, whether it's forest conservation or wildlife uh, uh, um, conservation as well. So Red Cross is a good thing, but it also they sign up to the UN. So it's all of the possible I think for me all of them has to do with power of the NGOs to be able to engage to mobilize. Because if you take that away from the community, you cannot have that conservation. Thank you. Next question. Uh, thank you. I'd like to ask a follow-up question to the one just asked about uh, conserving forests. You, you mentioned that states play a big role. and uh, I just am wondering uh, how successful they have been in incentivizing people to conserve forests, because uh, given the enormous pressures now and in the future of population, of food, uh, to supply that population, we, we've already heard how, uh, you know, agriculture is encroaching all over the continent on, on uh, you know, protected, well, not necessarily protected areas, but on forested areas, on savannah, on other 
types of uh, habitat. And Red Plus, of course, is meant to provide some incentives, but you know the, the payments under that scheme seem to pale by comparison to what the opportunity cost is of keeping the forest standing rather than cutting it and clearing it for growing food or growing crops for export or whatever. So I'm, I'm just wondering if it has been successful, how has it been in Nigeria? I'll, I'll try to answer the question on knowledge. I think it has worked in some instances because we want to raise awareness of the need to preserve the forest. Yeah, if you could just speak up, I understand that there's some challenges. Oh, so sorry. I mean, for, for me, my experience is to raise awareness about the need to preserve forests and also to have participation of both communities and government as well. Um, but the thing is, government alone cannot preserve the forest alone, even NGOs. So, so it requires a lot of effort, for including IUCN's effort as well, along with government, NGOs, and the community. And most important are the young people. They have to inherit this, this, this future, as you say it. But I have seen a challenge where Involving young people has to be induced. It's not organic in Africa. It's not organic at all. I think we can talk about that. That it needs to be an organic process. We need to beg for it. I have spent my life begging to be involved as a young person all my life. So I've seen it. And when I see politicians on their own do that, it inspires. I think so. So to me. It's all inclusive. Government needs to do more. NGOs need to do more. Young people need to do more. We all have to do more because I'm really the subsistence, I know, um, subsistence farmers. Um, one of the issues for um, forests is uh, that there is, a, you know, a lot of illegal logging going on, and subsistence farmers that are needing to follow up from what you were just saying earlier. That are um, consistently sort of needing to grow the crops on agricultural. From what I understand, um, when these forests uh, get taken down, um, the topsoil gets turned over over and over again and uh, eventually becomes completely arid and crops can't grow on it. So this is feeding into the bigger issue of climate change um, and the issues that come from that which are going to stem right through to the water source and food production for a growing population in Africa. What would be your um, advice to um, organisations that are trying to um, uh, help local communities to um, benefit from other values other than um, great crops and agriculture? Um, so, coming, coming from a place of uh, personal experience, going into a culture that was not necessarily mine, um, I have learned to ask permission to both learn about the culture as well as use the culture for different things, whether it was my craft or um, other means of sharing. I really think that the one thing that has been done wrong from where I see it is that there is a division of us and them, West and you know the rest of the world, and coming into communities that are in need for whatever greater or smaller reason, if you can take your example with agriculture, it can be peace, it can be um, poaching, there are many, many things, or, or uh, forestry. There are many things that needs to be um, kind of reversed. And the way to reverse it is not necessarily to look at it as an entire system, not, not as a specific problem, but understanding why, and somebody mentioned it before, why they're doing what they're doing. Why did the people in the Amazon, for example, chose to continue burning their forest while they knew it affects the environment, they chose to build you know, real estate around those areas. And so why, why do people in Bali, and again, this is a good example, uh, don't want to continue uh, their uh, parents' uh, job of becoming a carver or being a priest or doing anything that is part of their tradition. Uh, there is a lot to do with how they see themselves. There's a lot to do with loss of identity. There's a lot to do with uh, feeling that they are not comparable to what the West is considering to be successful. And so most of this young, young generation and the values of those societies are not being able to be applied. And I see my role with this kind of project, and I was actually um, asked a couple of weeks ago to come to Ethiopia to work with local communities. Um, this is a really good example when I'm thinking about it. Ask, to come into local communities of jewelers and teach them jewelry making. And my response was, I can come and learn from them how they've been making jewelry and 
what I can bring is perhaps showing them a way that they can become more relevant to the outside world, how to create infrastructure for their building, for their business, how to think about designing a collection, things that I've been doing, branding and all that. But I don't need to teach them how to make jewelry. They have been doing this for 2,000 years. They have a tradition, they have local materials. This is to me a way to look at it, that through this kind of project, for example, their identity can grow. Their, their connection to who they are can grow. They will feel enough, right? They feel they matter. And from that place, they can be sustainable. And my job is, I have an exit strategy. I don't need to stay there uh, for as long as I am alive. Um, I do feel that as an NGO or someone who comes to be a support, we all need to have an exit strategy. Our job is not to stay there forever. Our job is to train, to give the tools, and to allow the people who live in those lands and countries and to preserve and grow and develop their own identity rather than impose it on them. Thank you. Yeah, just, just to add to that, we need to, to recognize indigenous knowledge, um, whether it's in agriculture, whether it's in conservation, it's always there. Africa is not just popular today, we've been there for ages. So I think we need to recognize that, and that really helps. So when you go into a community to do a service, to provide, you need to recognize this already exists, and you talk to them, and they tell you what they need. Um, and then when you transfer that, it has to be a two-way, two things. Yes. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, yeah, I totally agree with, with and totally agree. it's so important to also work with local people. Instead of trying to go find a resource somewhere else, we have so much resources in our own country. And it's important, exactly, and it's important that our, our leaders um, that encourage that by, by by looking at finding the people who are who have all those knowledge and try to to um, to uh, gather those information so we can re relate those information to our young generation. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. We have time for one more. What do you think is missing um, for you in your line of work, for youth in general, for our generation? What do you think is missing that the people in this room need to understand so that that somebody here may be able to have that answer. That's number one. Uh, number two, um, as young people in conservation, in um, and social enterprise, trying to change the society, I heard a lot of you saying that we're always asking to be involved, to be included. And I hate this when I told, fight for your space, fight for your platform, fight for your rights. And whenever someone tells you that, that means they don't know how to empower you. So I want to ask, how does it feel to have these lack of opportunities and these silos, and how can we bridge those gaps? So, uh, thank you for this question. They're so interesting. So, for me, the challenges I've been facing with um, with the countries in Africa is just I'm, I'm trying to send my books just for for free to orphan to to orphanages to uh, to school in Africa that are looking for it, and it's so difficult because I will I like just the, the fact to send the product. They are they they are they they stopped. Um, they have to pay taxes on those things. And I'm like, oh, they're for free. They're for schools. Um, so that that's one of the things that if 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 we have help, it will be like, okay, we have all that, all these ideas. We have all these books, and we want to, to have them. To, we want them to reach Africa and to reach those children. So I sent a lot of books to Ghana, for example, uh, which reorganized, and, and I have some help, and I sent a lot of books from California to Ghana, I sent backpacks and all kinds of different things that I create for children. And we need, we need to have the chance to be able to, uh, to send those things, even without asking, asking for, for them to pay. We just want to be able to send a message to start, to start impacting those children with all the little create, creative things that we can, we can do. Okay, so I'll try with the question of what is missing. Uh, so in my 10 year work, when I started, I felt kind of alone um, because 10 years, we talked about climate so much, and you know, young people these days. But I lived in a place where uh, I saw, you know, I believe in this called Spring Road, all right? Uh, it's a spring, and I learned this is that spring, I learned how to swim. And then, so democracy came back to Nigeria, and the parliamentarians took over the place and changed the name of the roads to Parliamentary Road. They, they just destroyed the spring. Okay, that's just that's, that's reality. So I felt a little bit alone. Uh, but as I grew up, I realized that people really did care. So those people had to step forward. Um, 
And then they gave us spaces to act, for example, Action 8 and the rest of They came out because they really care. So there are people who really care. I didn't see them then, but they came out. So I think if you're genuinely passionate, you need to just step up. Um, you step on it and just step up and support because by, by, you, by stepping up, you're helping someone out there. Uh, I think that's one thing our politicians are a bit afraid of, to do, do good thing. When you do good, it makes it goes a long way when you do good. So I think that's what I like to say. Please, if you're doing good, please genuinely do good. Um, and when you're conscious, if you, your kids will be proud. I mean, I mean, they can even Instagram you're good, you know. Um, so, <laughs> so that's, and then um, not being alone. Um, this is a bit, a bit funny. I I love Liverpool, so I never walk alone. So that's also <laughs> my life. That's <laughs> one my life principles. And it really helped a lot, so I never really walk alone. So that's the thing. And um, um, uh, I don't know, I think that's opportunities. Yeah, it's, for me, the biggest opportunity we have is social media. I'm telling you, it's the biggest thing we have is social media at home. I mean, we can use that to, to, to do good so much that we do bad things. For example, now my, my, myself and my peers are starting this hashtag called Stop uh, Wildlife Crime NG. Um, we're starting tomorrow. So we're using that to talk about how we can use, you know, I mean, we saw the film, they were taking, they, they took photos of the animal and they even took photos of selling it. So we could do the good thing with social media than, than, than the bad thing. I think for me, that's, that's it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I will answer it in order, but if I miss something, remind me of it. Um, I would start by saying that the greatest advantage of our time is all the bad things that are happening. My tendency actually is to always see the half cup full. And I can choose, obviously, to be um, upset about a lot of things that I uh, feel bringing all of us down. But if you try to look at the uh, outcome of all the things that have been happening in the past 10, 15 years with climate, and politics and poverty and war, there is a lot of casualties that they are so unfortunate. But when you talk about what sustainability is, that the way the UN um, defined it is creating, um, sustaining what we have now and creating a better future for the next generation. So if we're looking at it in that way, if we have um, enough patient and an outlook to look 20 years from now, 50 years from now, when we are not no longer here, but we wish to keep and preserve and develop and have our kids inherit something different, um, this is a time when change happened. It didn't happen before. You know, it's like putting a frog in the boiling water and slowly, slowly boiling. It doesn't feel that it's boiling and it ends up becoming food. That's almost how we went, but I think there is a big wake up call. And I will take it to your last question, I think it was about filling the role in the journey. Actually, what pushed me in every step of the way in the past three years that I've been um, speaking for and in account of being using your voice and your platform as an activist is the response of first my customers, who everyone I found wanted to do something good, they just didn't know how. And all of a sudden, they get to buy a piece of jewelry that they can go into a room and share the promise of what, or the story, right, of what they stand up for, which is sustainable world, peace, preservation of cultures and, and the nature. And this is something that they might not have been able to share or evoke, but it becomes a piece of conversation. So they become ambassadors just by wearing a piece of jewelry, donating uh, proceeds from sales to um, um, specific organizations that are uh, benefiting to make promote the same. Um, so I don't feel alone. I think, um, I, I predict that this year will hopefully be five times the size if not more next year and in years to come it will grow because we need to have a diversified conversation with different opinions and different outlooks and different cultures and different experiences because the more we have that, the better chance we can create a better future. Thank you. Thank you.